Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. Are you ready to get started? I'm ready. <laughs> it was my turn, right? It was, yeah. <laughs> okay, good good. Job. good job. Hey guys, I'm Sydney. And I'm Jess. And this and this is malpractice. Is malpractice. <laughs> <laughs> this is us, and we did it, and we said what we were, and we said who we are. Bang bang. <laughs> we're happy you're here. Thanks for listening. Today we're going to do things a little differently than our normal format. We have a very interesting interview for y'all, so we're going to kind of jump right into the topic. If you're listening to this, you probably already know that today we're going to talk about the intensive care unit or the ICU, plus sedation and an insane phenomenon called ICU delirium, which I had actually never even heard of. Jess, had you heard of that before? No, I never heard of it. And I went back to my medical experiences in Grey's Anatomy, Mm -hmm. and they never touched on that. And so I feel that my medical education is has failed you just all screwed up <laughs> because of Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, honestly, Grace, what are you doing? If you're not covering you even every doing? medical topic faithfully, are you even real? <laughs> and you have like 55 seasons. Like, get it together. They have Grace. so many seasons. They're literally are they on their 18th season? Honestly, couldn't tell. I had to stop watching because. I loved some of the characters and they left. And so I yeah. said I got to bounce. <laughs> they snippy snipped out some of the original cast and I did not like it. Bye bye me. Wait, if Grey's Anatomy were a child, it'd be in its first year of college. That is. <gasps> Am I that old? <laughs> Just Correct. I hate it. I hate it here. <laughs> I'm so old. <laughs> Correct. That just hurt You're my old. feelings so bad. I'm so sorry. I thought it, and it immediately came to me, and I was like, this is the worst thing I've ever thought. I have to say it to Jess. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a bummer. All righty. Oops, it's not getting better from here. <laughs> So basically, the entire point of the ICU or the intensive care unit is that patients with super severe or life-threatening illnesses or injuries come into the ICU, and they're usually on some kind of life support equipment at that point, which ensures that they can perform their normal or necessary like bodily functions, right? Like eating and breathing, okay? They generally have facilities, ICUs generally have facilities with much higher staff to patient ratios than normal clinics meaning that they have more clinic staff available to take care of these super sick or super injured patients who need lots of attention. And that means they also typically have access to equipment and resources that people in less dire straits don't have, which is important. So ICU staff may look after patients who have conditions like septic shock, where your organs are damaged in response to some kind of infection. And this is super life-threatening, so yeah. um, really important condition to take care of, like, like ASAP. Like, you die. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's, like, the worst. <laughs> it really is. It really is. Yeah. If they're, like, you're septic, you're, like, I'm going to die. R.I.P. Like, yeah. that, it's like that. It's such a bad bad prognosis. We're, we know everything. Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> Or something like ARDS, which is Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Basically, that's where your lungs stop working for one of several reasons like physical trauma, pneumonia, or something that's super topical and relevant right now, the symptoms of COVID-19, right? Right, right, right. So when your lungs stop working, it requires a pretty invasive medical procedure that everyone is pretty familiar with in the middle of this pandemic, which is putting patients on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. And they call this mechanical or assisted ventilation. And this is an invasive procedure that requires either an endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy tube down your trachea and hook your lungs up to a machine that pumps the air in and out, essentially breathing for you when you can't breathe. So while that can be really different from patient to patient, generally when you're put on a ventilator, 
It's been a pretty standard practice in medicine to treat those people with a combination of drugs to help prevent like discomfort, pain, anxiety. So they typically administer things, first of all, like analgesics of some kind, right? So if you remember the opioid epidemic, one of the things they often give people is fentanyl, that really Mm -hmm. strong opioid, which sounds great, right? You don't want people in the ICU to experience pain, and a lot of them are in life-threatening positions, so they're experiencing lots of pain and the nurses and staff want to keep them as comfortable as possible. But the other thing that's a really common practice and the one that our guest today is actually fighting is deep sedation for ventilated patients. Now, a few decades ago, deep sedation was really important because of how low tech the ventilators were at the time. And we'll get into that later with our guest. But now that we have more modern ventilators, it's not always necessary and it can, in fact, be super detrimental to be sedated. What the medical field is learning more about now is something called ICU delirium or ICU psychosis. And this is what we had never heard of before. So more and more people who have survived and recovered from sedation in the ICU are coming forward with stories of outright terrifying auditory and visual hallucinations. A lot of them are experiencing things like PTSD after experiencing these hallucinations because of how traumatic they are. As today's guest will discuss... Most people think that sedated patients in the ICU are like quote-unquote comfortable and quote-unquote sleeping. But one trauma physician at Vanderbilt who specializes in brain dysfunction says it says of these patients, they're not sleeping. Their brains are on fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're learning kind of more about that now. And our guest is really, really passionate about this and so cool. But the current theory is basically that the hallucination are your brain's reaction to the copious amounts of drugs used to sedate the patients, as well as the physical Uh, stimuli that the patients are experiencing. So some of these drugs include propofol, benzodiazepines like midazolam, lorazepam, clonidine, ketamine, as well as neuromuscular blockers. And these are really common to sedate patients who have been ventilated. So we now know that according to some metrics, approximately 80% of ventilator patients suffer from ICU delirium, That's which is a horrific statistic. So scary. Right. <laughs> so scary. Right. Absolutely. So let's get into today's interview because our guest today is educating the medical industry and the public about the realities of what goes on in the ICU, and she's doing it one podcast at a time. Which we love. Love it. We love a podcast at a time. Friend of the pod. So Kaylee, <laughs> Kaylee Dayton is a nurse practitioner in a medical surgical intensive care unit, ICU. She is also the host of a really unique and interesting podcast called Walking Home from the ICU, where she tells her listeners about the journeys of patients who come through the ICU, specifically focusing on leaving or discharge sedation or medically induced comas and immobility. Plus, she's starting a consulting business where she goes around and she educates and works with ICU spaces and kind of brings their practices into, you know, 2021. So Mm -hmm. we love to see a change in medicine. Her long-term goal is to educate the public and improve patient outcomes. She's just an advocate and consultant. So we're really excited to bring this episode to you. So welcome, Kaylee. Welcome, Kaylee. Thanks for being here. I'm Kaylee Dayton. I'm an ICU nurse practitioner. And I have a podcast called Walking Home from the ICU. Um, It is based off of my experiences in what I call on the podcast, the awake and walking ICU. Hmm. And that is really unique to hear. So anyone that works in the ICU has to almost hear that title again, because it goes against everything that the ICU culture is acclimated to. Mm -hmm. So when I started as a nurse back in 2012, I started in the awake and walking ICU. So that's all I knew of critical care. I thought it was normal to have patients awake on the ventilator or the breathing machine or life support, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was normal to have them riding on the board, getting up into the chair, walking around the halls. That was what I thought critical care was about, connecting with patients, talking to them, working through critical illness Mm. with the patient. And then after a few years, I became a travel nurse 
And I started going to different ICUs around the country and was suddenly immersed in this culture of deep sedation and immobility, meaning every patient that I took that was on a ventilator was comatose. They were in a medically induced coma. Yeah. There was no eye opening. There was no communication. There was no connection. There was no getting up out of bed. Um, I was having to turn them every two hours. Yeah. Um, and so I, it felt wrong and different, but no one in these ICUs knew what I was talking about when I would ask, Hey, can I, can I wake them up and get them up? Cause I knew that these patients could do it. Yeah. They were the same kind of patients, the same level of sickness that I had taken care of before, but they were sedated. I didn't understand why. And I tried to have these conversations and I would say, can I get them up? Can I wake them up? And they say, no, cause they're intubated. And that didn't make sense because that didn't match my experiences. And I say, but why are they sedated? Yeah. And they say, because they're intubated. And we just go through these circles and they didn't understand what I was talking about. I didn't know where they were coming from. Mm-hmm. And so that was my experience for a few years. And I just didn't feel like I had much control as a travel nurse. And so I just did what they did there, Yeah, which is keep the sedation on. Yeah. And then I went to grad school. I went back to the wake and walking ICU. And as I started going into the research, I started realizing the reality behind medically induced comas. And I kept thinking, people don't know this. The ICU community doesn't know it. The general public doesn't know it. So I started the podcast and then the webinar program and my consulting company Mm -hmm. to help the ICU community and even the general public understand how we can change patients' outcomes, even their survival rates, by letting them be awake and walking, which may sound really simple to the general public, but for the ICU world, that's like telling them the world is flat. (laughs) <laughs> so okay. my mission is to change the ICU culture. So that's why I have this podcast. That's what I do. Very cool. So why are there those two distinct strains of thought in ICU care, do you think? It's a little bit complicated. Love that. <laughs> we love complication. <laughs> so I think that sedation, and when I say sedation, I mean the medically induced coma, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. These medications that we're giving patients are the same, usually the same kind of medications that you get when you you are in surgery, which is great for surgery, right? You come out to your little loopy after surgery, but then you're fine. And you don't remember what happened. You're spared the pain, the trauma, right? Sedation can be such a good thing. Those are miracle drugs for that purpose. We started using them in the ICU when we started keeping patients alive on ventilators for longer. And this is probably back in around the nineties. Mm-hmm. We started being able to take care of ARDS patients, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So patients like COVID-19 patients, people with really sick lungs that need a lot of pressure and oxygen through the breathing machine. Okay. And we started being able to keep them alive for not just hours or days, but even weeks. The problem is when lungs were that sick, they needed a lot of pressure, a lot of support. So the machines are pushing in oxygen at really high levels. The ventilators back in the nineties were archaic. Yeah. They just slammed Mm -hmm. air in and pulled it out. Ventilators now have evolved. Now ventilators can change and adjust for the patient. You can adjust the volume, the pressure, the timing Mm -hmm. of the breath. So it's much more sensitive and it can sense your breaths. So you can trigger a breath and then it just provides extra support depending on the settings. We started sedation back in the nineties because patients really were so uncomfortable and they couldn't breathe with the ventilator. They couldn't synchronize. And that made it really hard to keep the lungs safe during that time. Yeah. If there's that much dyssynchrony with the ventilator. So we were giving drugs called benzodiazepines Mm -hmm. like Ativan, um, Versed, really high dose opioids like morphine continuously to keep people so comatose that they didn't move a muscle and didn't take any of their own breath. Mm -hmm. Perhaps back in the nineties, it was out of necessity, but what they started seeing about after 10 years of doing that is that people that survived that process were extremely broken and their quality of life was, was almost laughable. What they found was that deep sedation. So those kind of medications that we received during surgery, when we received those for not a few hours, but a few days or a few weeks or even months, it causes acute brain dysfunction. Mm -hmm. That's hard to tell what's going on when someone's comatose. You don't see what their brain's doing. 
but often they're what, what's called ICU delirium. It used to be called ICU psychosis, mm -hmm. and it's a state of confusion, inability to pay attention. They can't follow reality. And what the patients often experience is complete terror, hallucinations, yeah. delusions. They're in alternative realities that are often far worse than the reality of being critically ill on the ventilator in the ICU. Yeah. They're watching their loved ones be dismembered, genital mutilation, rape. They think that they're kidnapped in enemy territory. I, I just interviewed a survivor in my podcast and he said, I don't know how my imagination even conjured up those images. I'm not a morbid person, Yeah. but these were the most gruesome scenarios that could have ever been imagined. And wow. it's not just a bad dream for them. It's the reality. It is. Yeah. They, they describe it as more real than what they're experiencing talking to me at that time. Wow. And that is what causes post ICU PTSD. So after giving patients these kind of big medications for so long, then they're interviewing patients and they're doing studies on them. And they're realizing that the more patients receive these medications, the longer they were under sedation, the more PTSD they had. Yeah. And so why did you, what made you choose this particular health profession and in particular working in the ICU? Uh, my dad is a veterinarian and I grew up working in his clinic which you think would draw me to animals, but rather I realized that I <laughs> love the medical side and I love the people. And I always felt like I would do critical care. I don't know if it was just my personality was drawn to that kind of pressure intensity, but I also liked the opportunity of mm -hmm. constantly learning, constantly being challenged and being surrounded by people that were way smarter than me. I have a friend whose mom uh, passed away about five years ago and she was in the ICU and critical care and one of the, I guess a couple of the actually, but the nurses there, like we are still friends with her. Like she's like, we babysat her kids. Like mm. she went to her wedding. The nurse, the staff there were, I mean, some of the nicest people and so patient focused. It was just unbelievable. And I mean, specifically her name's Katie, but Katie was such a, it became such a like part of our life. Like I still talk to Katie. <laughs> so that's another reason why I went into ICU or especially why I stayed in it because those connections are, are celestial. I think they're eternal. Yeah. I'm a spiritual person. And I feel like when I cross over the other side, there's going to be like a huge tunnel of people waiting for me to high five. Right. Like, cause I've been with so many wonderful families and the patients that I've cared for that have passed. And then I've made lifelong friends yeah. because you're an intimate part of a sacred moment in someone's life and the end of their life. And I love, I actually am totally okay with the death. And I love being there for those conversations and working through that with patients and some are harder than others, but it's really neat when patients are yeah. ready. And even when they're not ready, there's a whole nother tangent, but when babies are born, we're so excited, right? It's a sweet, beautiful spiritual experience to welcome this perfect innocent spirit into our lives, but we're welcoming them into the world of trial and pain and gloom and so many yeah. hard things are happening. And yet it's, it's a sweet moment, right? But I think when someone gets to leave all of this behind mm -hmm. and to enter into a world of light and happiness and joy, that should also be a celebration. So that perspective has really enhanced my experience in the ICU. And I, and you can feel it being present for someone's passing when they pass over to the other side, that is indescribable and usually can be really actually joyful. Yeah, that's beautiful. So interesting you say that. We just interviewed a grief uh, specialist and like you and he would get along very well. He he yeah. does get along with most people, to be honest, but <laughs> it, we like just interviewed him. So this kind of topic of like care and mental health around like grieving and loss and all of that is very top of mind for us. Yeah. And I like the way you described Katie, your nurse, because that's that is the experience I have with almost all nurses and people that I work with in the ICU because it's such a high intensity environment and you deal with so much tragedy. And right now there's so much pressure on them. I think mm -hmm. there becomes a reputation of those people that go into ICU are calloused and mm -hmm. heartless or robotic. And we have to, we do develop protective measures and, and characteristics to help protect ourselves. We can't have bleeding hearts all the time. Yeah. And yet 
people go into the ICU for the same reason I do, because they love people, they want to alleviate human suffering, and they want to save lives. So when I talk about these flaws in our process of care, it's not to discriminate or to demonize any specific person or discipline. Anyone that works in the ICU and follows these practices, they're just, they've inherited these things. Yeah. This is not because anyone is trying to harm patients or want to cause no. right. PTSD or increase their chances of dying. They have no idea. And once they find out, most people are fired up. So I, I feel like once yeah. nurses, especially know the reality, know what can be, they're going to turn this ship around. They're going to, they're going to change all of critical care and medicine will never be the same because nurses love patients and they are going to do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Even with your concerns around sedation, uh, I think in one of your episodes, you said that like 68% of nurses think that patient comfort is the purpose of sedation. So it's like, even if they are doing the wrong thing, they're doing it for the right reasons, or they think they're doing it to help the patient, right? Absolutely. And a really common phrase or mentality shared in the ICU is, if I was on a ventilator, you better give me all the drugs, knock me out. And I think that comes from we have been trying to lighten sedation and trying to do things called sedation vacations, Mm -hmm. which you start sedation. I mean, you make people comatose for a few days or however long, and then you try to weed it back because we're starting to know that it's probably what we should do. Try to see if someone can be awake on the ventilator. The problem is that Mm -hmm. once we've already given sedation for a certain amount of time, we've given them delirium. Yeah. So what happens when we pull off sedation? They're a bucking rodeo. Yeah. They're thrashing and you can see the terror in their eyes and they have no idea what's going on in reality. But from our side of the bedside, it looks like they're so uncomfortable on the ventilator and it's the breathing tube. So they assume that that kind of agitation and agony is coming from the ventilator. Mm-hmm. When patients or survivors will tell you, no, it's because they thought their kids were kidnapped and their hands were tied down and something was in their throat. Yeah. It had very little to do with the ventilator themselves, but they didn't have a chance to know what was really going on. So from the nurse's side, they see that kind of horror mm-hmm. and they're like, Mm-mm. not here. <laughs> right. Nope. I'm not living. With that. You better. But, so then you turn the station back on and poof, it goes away. Now the patient's so much more comfortable and it's all better. Yeah. And that's where we get this mentality of, I want to help patients. So I want them to be uh, sleep because mm-hmm. we, we call sedation sleep. We'll tell family members at the bedside, well, they're asleep now. Oh, they're still asleep. When studies have shown, when you look at what's going on inside the brain on EEG, that is not sleep. The brain is too disruptive to even sleep. Yeah. So not only are we causing the psychosis, but p- perhaps part of that is caused because we deprive them of sleep for days to weeks. I can't even go 24 hours without sleep without yeah. getting loopy yeah. and unpleasant. I see, right? <laughs> unpleasant, right? And we're expecting patients to be okay after we deprive them of sleep for weeks. Yeah. Of course, their yeah. brains are injured. And of course, they never function the same after that. Yeah, that's crazy. Where did you get the idea to do, you know, survivor, as you say, interviews? Like, when did you, I don't know if you want to share like your first, where yeah. you're like, are, what happened? Like, when, what did that what was that like for you? I had two contrasting experiences. So I had worked in the wake and walk in ICU. Then I had gone to be a travel nurse and I had these very different practices, right? And I saw different outcomes. I didn't really know what that all yeah. meant. No one sat me down and said, here's what life after the ICU looks like. Here's what we need to prevent. No one explained that to me. So even though I had done some of the right things, I didn't know why. Mm-hmm. I just knew, again, it's just what we did there. So I came back to Salt Lake City and I was working, I was floating around to different hospitals and I was in the cafeteria of a hospital and someone yelled from across the cafeteria, Hey, I know you. And I turned around and it was this uh, woman that looked so familiar and it took me a minute and I saw she had some missing fingers and she looked, she was really distinct. And I suddenly was thrown back into this flashback and I remembered the room, the ventilator, her pneumonia, her anxiety. And I remember pushing her to walk. And as I'm reliving this, she'd come closer to me and she said, you were my nurse in the ICU. And I thought I hated you. You were so mean to me. And I thought, oh, <laughs> yep, I was hard on her. Yep. I made her work for anxiety. She didn't want to walk because at baseline, she used a scooter and a walker and she barely could walk at baseline. So there she was on the ventilator 
And if she didn't walk, if she didn't get up, if she got any weaker, she wasn't going to be off the ventilator. She was going to have to be on a tracheostomy and go to a care facility. She would write to me on the board. Her goal was to get home to her partner and her dog. So I remember her saying, you have to do this. You have to get up. We have to get you home. So I, in my mind, I thought I was being a cheerleader, but she thought I was being a bully. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was starting to feel kind of bad and I was, didn't really know how to explain myself. And suddenly she interrupted my thoughts and with this huge bear hug Aww. and she was using a walker. She was up and walking. So she grabbed me this bear hug and she said, but you saved my life and I have loved you ever since. Hmm. And I really had to ponder that. You saved my life. She never coded. I mean, she never, I didn't do CPR on her. Sure. I gave her medications. I kept her ventilator going. That's true. But I really had to think, what did she mean yeah. by you saved my life? Mm-hmm. And I think I came to realize that she meant you got me home. Mm-hmm. I got to go back to what life meant for me. Yeah. She did not want to go to a care facility and she didn't have to. She went directly home, but it all came down to her being awake and moving on the ventilator. So. There was that experience. And then shortly after that, I was on a plane, started chatting with the guy next to me and told him I was an ICU nurse at the time. And the color just dropped from his face. And he was in his late forties. And he started trying to tell me about his experience in the ICU. He talked about how he had this really bad infection. He was on the ventilator for a few weeks, but he, he barely talked about the ventilator. All he wanted to talk about were the hallucinations that he had. I don't even want to call it hallucinations. I call it experiences. Mm-hmm. His hands were nailed to the ground in the middle of the forest and trees were falling on him and monsters were coming out of the sky. And he couldn't really describe to me everything that he'd experienced. Even what he was trying to describe, he was having a hard time articulating because he was sobbing to me. He was crying. And this is four years after the fact. And he had not healed. Wow. And he said that um, every, and he didn't use the word delirium. He didn't know. I don't think he knew he had ICU delirium, Mm -hmm. but he said for a year after that, Every time he closed his eyes, he was thrown back into those scenarios. Mm. So he couldn't sleep. And he went to this huge psychotic spiral, ended up divorced. To that day, he had not gone back to work. So he's in his late 40s, not able to work. And um, he was a DNR, DNI, meaning a do not resuscitate, do not intubate. So he said, I don't care what condition I have, how critical I am, if even if it's reversible. I am not going back to the ICU. Wow. I would rather die than go through what I went through there. Wow. I can't live through that again. And he, and I, I didn't know what to say. I just sat there and cried with him. Right. And I just felt so much remorse and shame. I just thought that's not what I got into medicine for. I don't want to do that to people. I had no idea that that's what life was like for them after. And I realized as I started looking into things, clearly hit ICU delirium. And that was likely caused because of the standard treatment of deep sedation because he was on the ventilator. His words and his voice still haunt me. And I kept thinking as I read through the research, if the ICU community could hear him and then apply that to the research, there's no way we'd keep doing what we're doing. Right. We would, we would change. Yeah. The whole podcast came because again, I'm a spiritual person. I feel like God told me directly, thou shalt start a podcast. And this was in December of 2019. Before COVID hit, before I knew it would be a thing. <laughs> and suddenly I was just consumed with doing these certain episodes in this order. And survivors were at the very head of that. And they came out of nowhere. Yeah. I went onto survivor pages on Facebook and I would ask questions, but people were so eager to have their stories known. They wanted to dedicate their sufferings to something. Yeah. And so that's really where it came from, how much a survivor changed my perspective. Mm-hmm. And then realizing how eager survivors are to make sure that this doesn't happen to other people. And then COVID hit. And lo and behold, yeah, this is the most important yeah. thing for COVID because we have gone right backwards in our practices with COVID. What are some of the ways that COVID has, like, are you seeing more sedation or Often. what do you mean going backwards? Right. In just ch- chatting with people around the country, around the world. We have gone back to using a lot of the worst kind of medications for COVID patients for sedation. And part of that is because there were drug shortages. Right. Because we didn't change our culture, because we felt like every patient on a ventilator had to be deeply sedated, everyone was using the same drug, propofol. Yeah. Then they started to run out. Or people were getting weren't 
sedating enough. So they started adding on more medications on top of that. So we've continued in what we were doing and then gotten even worse. And part of that too, is because of the staffing crisis, you start sedation, you make people delirious. Now they're really dangerous because they can pull out their tubes. Yeah. Cause they don't know what's going on. Right. They're a huge liability, but right. two patients to one nurse is the standard. Mm-hmm. Now you have at least four patients to one nurse. How can they watch them if they're confused? Yeah. All you, all, the only way to keep that tube in it is to sedate them. Right. And so we've gotten in a really hard spot. And now a lot of nurses, especially that were new to medicine, don't know any other way. So we're continuing in that misinformation and that culture of deeply sedating everyone. My fear is that that's going to become the norm. That's absolutely yeah. terrifying. Just, I mean, I, I think I know the answer, but after this time of deep sedation, are there like counseling services? If you're deeply sedated for whatever period of time, you should be, boom, referred to a therapist. Yeah. That's one of my missions or plights on my podcast, because if someone gets a kidney injury or their lungs are still damaged, we discharge them from the ICU with appointments set up to go to a nephrologist or a pulmonologist. But if they've had delirium, you're on your own. We don't even tell patients that they've had delirium. We don't warn them, Hey, you might be suffering these symptoms of PTSD, or you might have cognitive deficit. And then we especially don't set them up with any psychological support or any rehabilitation services. A lot of places will just give them tracheostomies, feeding tubes, and they're still comatose. They're still pretty out of it. Yeah. So that's not someone that you can sit there and have a rational conversation with. They're still delirious. Yeah. Then we just ship them out to a long-term acute care hospital or rehabilitation center. And then it's up to them to set them up for the rest of their lives. Like they have a pulse. They're kind of breathing on their own. Maybe not. That's why they're still on a ventilator, but our job is done. So we just send them off. And I think that comes from not knowing what patients are going to face. We can't prepare them for the future. We don't know what the future has in store for them. We're pretty unaware of what life is going to look like. And I think a lot of places are still unaware of what delirium is. I also do legal consulting and I go through medical records and I look through and I see clear signs of delirium and talking to those survivors or those plaintiffs of these cases, they're reporting signs of the long-term effects of delirium. And yet in their medical records, no one has used the word delirium. No one diagnosed it with them. And rather, they kept giving the medications that caused delirium. So it's like someone comes in for an infection and you're giving them bacteria. Yeah. You're just worsening yeah. the problem. And yet that's what we do in the medical community. Instead of saying, okay, wait a minute, they have a brain injury. They have delirium. Let's get the family at the bedside. Let's avoid these medications. Let's mobilize them. Let's make them walk so they get tired and they get real sleep and we reset them. We do the opposite. We give them more sedation. We've kicked families out of the out of the ICU and the hospitals, so they have they're more isolated. They have nothing familiar, and yeah. they're stuck in their terror and delirium. Yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And talking about families, um, one of the episodes you published, and I think it was last year, was like a two parter that was called "Loved Ones Are Survivors Too," which I think is a really cool idea, especially after we talked with our friend who works in hospice. And and we totally agree with that idea. But can you talk a little bit about like PTSD in caregivers and what you kind of hope to see change about the way that we treat caregivers or the way we handle like families in the ICU and things like that? Absolutely. Yeah, I feel really passionately about this because we have some problems going on. Yeah. I'm not sure why it started, but back in the day, especially in the ICU, um, there were strict visiting hours. One or two people could come in for certain hours of the day. And I don't know if they thought like visitors weren't going to increase infection rates or it was going to be dangerous or they were just in the way. I don't understand because I've never practiced that way. The awake and walk in ICU, even when it wasn't the cool thing to do, opened up the doors and said, get in here, family. You're part of the team. (laughs) Stay here. They need you. Yeah. That's what I'm used to. And I did work in other places where there were visiting hours and it didn't make sense. And especially doesn't make sense now with COVID. If a patient doesn't have COVID, they're still visiting hours. I'm like, is COVID only a threat one hour of the day? Right. I don't understand. But also we've done studies now and it shows that patient outcomes are improved when family is present. They're less likely to die. They're less likely to develop delirium. 
Um, they're more likely to be discharged from the hospital sooner, mm-hmm. especially if you have a patient that's critically ill and maybe can't tell you about themselves. Who's going to talk for them? Who knows them? Right. The family is an intricate part of the ICU. And so I think part of the PTSD can come from not being involved in the care and feeling totally helpless while their loved one, the person that is at the center of their lives is at death's door and they can do nothing. So what I'm used to is like having the family help with a bed bath and be part of rounds and part of the discussion and part of all the decision-making. I think there can be a lot of PCSC from having to make decisions without their loved one being able to weigh in. Yeah. Sometimes that's unavoidable. You know, if someone has a condition that's rendered them unconscious, there's nothing you can do about that. But with deep sedation, we take away the option of the patient having any say, any autonomy being at all informed. And suddenly it is all on the loved one. So if they've never discussed, do they want to be on a ventilator? Did they want CPR? Do they want to do all these treatments, even though it might be futile? What do they want? And there's no way to ask them because why? We shut them up with sedation. And that's a lot of stress and burden on the loved ones. Yeah, it's yeah. completely unfair to them. And then they get to live with those choices forever. From my perspective, a lot of times that patient's not going to get better no matter what. So let's discuss how to make them comfortable. But families can feel like we're giving up on them, that we're killing them, all these things that, in my experience, when you're able to talk to a patient directly, they'll say, okay, all right, get my family in here. Let's have a party. Let's say goodbye. I'm going to write my, lo- my, my last wishes. I'm going to sign my pension paperwork. We're going to close this up as much as we can, whatever they're capable of, to make sure that everyone has peace. Everyone gets to say goodbye. There's closure. And that's a problem too. Loved ones don't get to have closure. They wonder if the last thing they said to them was right or it was what they wanted to say. They didn't know that would be the last time they talked to them. Right. And that has to be so painful. And when we don't mm-hmm. sedate patients, then they get to go through that journey together. I had a survivor from the wake and walking ICU talk about how he wasn't sure how his wife would have done if he had been sedated. That would have been really traumatic for her to make all those decisions, but they got to make those decisions together. They got to support each other because it's trauma for the loved one. Also, it's not just the person in the bed, it's everyone involved, but we need each other. And so it's not fair to make them make all the decisions and have no support. And so I think they're just, we need a culture shift. We need to recognize the family is just as important as any other member on the team that they're going to carry some loads during and after the ICU as well. And I think they should have counseling and, and psychiatric support following this as well. And they also need to know what their family loved ones are going to experience after the ICU. They bring them home and they expect their loved ones to just slide back into their lives. Here's, here's the gap. Here's the mold that you fit into before. And I go resume as you were. And they're not. And that can be really traumatic too. They've lost the person that they loved. They're not themselves anymore. And now it's the burden of caring for them is up to them, but no one prepared them for that. Yeah. Yeah. If, if we have a listener right now, who's, you know, about to have to bring a loved one home from the ICU or is in the midst of it or whatever, everyone is going to encounter this at some point in theory, right? Mm -hmm. What is your advice on first, second, third steps in supporting that loved one in that transition mm-hmm. out of ICU back into regular life, whatever that means. Yeah. I'm, I'm not the expert on those transitions, right? Cause I work in the ICU. That's where we have this big gap, right? We need a bridge. What I understand from survivors is that they need a minute. Yeah. There should be no expectation to just jump back to work. Okay. They need to stay stimulated and feel like they're progressing. For people that are actively in the ICU at the time, ICU diaries are really helpful. When the family members keep a record of what's happened in each mm. change, that way the patient can look back and see and realize how sick they were and how far they've come. But also if they had delirium, if they were confused, they can look back and, and their memories can be rectified. Like, oh, that wasn't a gunshot. That was a chest tube. Oh, got it. Yeah. That I wasn't handcuffed, those were restraints. And that can really help their trauma and help them heal when they can change their memories through that. And that can be really empowering for the family members as well. So like they're doing something helpful and also therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah. There are support groups 
I think Vanderbilt has a post ICU support group, but I think more are developing. So there are some on Facebook as well as hospitals are making them. And so I think that's a really good place for family members and and survivors to go to. So they can be with people that have been through similar experiences. They can see what their recovery was like, get tips and ideas. Hopefully in the future, we'll have more post ICU clinics. Um, that's a really new approach. And there are only a few in the country. But hopefully that becomes more common because primary care doctors are not prepared to handle these kind of disabilities, essentially. We are, we've really named people and no one knows yeah. why this has happened to them. Yeah. And so hopefully we'll have more resources available to everyone as they come out. And I think COVID's going to help change that because now we have masses of people and young people that have spent weeks in medically induced comas and are severely disabled and are yelling back at us saying, what just happened yeah. to me? And hopefully that holds us accountable and we'll have to develop yeah. safety nets for them and support systems that previous ICU survivors never had. That's a great thought. Having been around a loved one who was in the ICU, I mean, like Jess said, you know, we've we've both had really good experiences with, you know, nurses and doctors in the ICU and, and staff in the ICU in general that that really changed the way we saw our loved ones being cared for. So if we had a listener who saw something like that and wanted to thank the staff of the ICU, what would you suggest? That's a great question. And I when I think back to my interactions with families, some of the most impactful tokens of gratitude that I've received are letters. When um I can barely even talk about it, but when people have written me letters and just they sent it to the unit saying to Kaylee, the ICU NP, and it magically got to me. They identified ways in which they were touched or ways that those experiences helped them and and that I was helpful to them. And I think that is a lot of what our community needs right now. Nurses especially feel extremely devalued yeah. and taken for granted. And they have put their mental health, physical health, everything on the line to care for these patients. And so I think they're kind of tired of pizza. Yeah. <laughs> I think they need to know <laughs> that what they did all their work and their sacrifices meant something yeah, and that they personally offered something that was of value to someone else and that their career and their livelihood and their, their life mission is making a difference. Cause that's a big question during the burnout is people are dying all the time. Anyways, why am I even yeah. here? Mm-hmm. And no one appreciates us. So I think write them a letter, tell them specifically what you appreciated ways in which they helped and how, what that meant to you. Don't worry. We'll cry with you. <laughs> <laughs> We've been crying on interviews lately. <laughs> it's just <laughs> not my best look, but I I'm a that. crier. I, I, yeah. And what motivates you to keep doing this, to keep advocating for patients and survivors to start your consulting, you know, company? I mean, that it's so cool because you're really going to change so many lives through these contracts with providers, care providers. Like mm-hmm. it's just that is a fact. It's going to happen. So what so. motivates you to keep doing that? Yeah, podcasting is a lot of work, right? And so uh, I've had life going on. It's been really busy. I have three little oh, wow. kids, <laughs> one with a neuromuscular disorder. Like things are going on. So what keeps me going is survivors that reach out and they thank me for the validation that they've received, even though the podcast is centered towards IC providers for survivors to find and hear and listen to other people that have gone through what they've been through. They realize that they're not crazy and they're not alone. And when they tell me about their sufferings, it just fires me up and reminds me of how much we need to prevent this from happening over and over again. Also, it has been so satisfying and fulfilling to have clinicians reach out and tell me their success stories. So on Instagram, Facebook, email, people reach out and they're like, I got someone a wick today. And they were writing on the board and they were using sign language and I speak sign language. And I sat her up on the side of the bed and everyone thought I was crazy. My whole team was telling me not to, and they were so upset about it. And then the patient gave me a big hug and Mm -hmm. we had this awesome moment and she got off the ventilator the next day and has been so grateful that I did that. Those moments, that's when I feel like, okay, this, this does have a, have a mission. This is why I'm supposed to do this. Giving the mic to the survivors and the researchers, it's exactly what we need. And having actual people at the bedside and understanding their power to change what's going on has been really exciting. And so consulting is exciting too. 
I was reached out to by medical director in California. He had been practicing for 45 years. Wow. And he heard me as a guest on a different critical care podcast. And he emailed me, hunted down my email, and basically already had his ba- bags packed to go visit Salt Lake City. <laughs> he said, I'm coming and I need you to come work with us as a consultant. And I'd already been thinking about consulting work, right? Mm-hmm. And so that was mm-hmm. extremely validating. And it was so neat to see here how humble he was. Very seasoned, very knowledgeable, medical director of like 60 ICUs. And yet he was excited at the prospect of change. And he said, you made me feel bad. I feel so bad. I'm haunted by what I heard. We're hurting people. I thought I was doing the right thing and I wasn't, and I want to change this. This is a legacy I want to leave before I retire. That filled me with so much hope because there's a lot of opposition. People, you're afraid of what you don't know. This is different to what they've ever done before. And here I am saying, you were trying to help people, but you were breaking them. And this is what you've always done, but we're going to do the opposite. That's hard to hear. Yeah. It reminded me of how good people are, especially in the medical community, that they're hungry to change and to do better and to really help people. So those moments of validation just fuel my fire and just give me more and more ideas. And I think this is going to continue to grow. And my next episode coming up, I've compiled a bunch of clips of success stories from clinicians who listened to the podcast, oh. made those little changes and saw awesome results. And now they're getting addicted. Oh. And even though the rest of their team think that they're crazy and have all, all the opposition, there are some huge hardcore revolutionists out there that are going to turn this around. Yeah. That has to be so validating. I yeah. I just saw, I just started pushing record on zoom, right. Talking to my mic. And <laughs> now I feel like I'm really connecting with people and good people that are going to be lifelong friends. You've been so generous with your time and thank you so much for being here. I, like most people and probably the general public, had no idea that this was even a thing. I had no idea before listening to your podcast that this was an issue. Yeah. So I'm I'm so happy to know about this now and, and to tell our listeners about it. And I would say to the, the general public as well that we need to discuss these things with our loved ones before we ever get close to the ICU. So we need to decide, do we want a ventilator? Yeah. And ventilators aren't the problem with COVID. People have given ventilators a bad rap, like in New York, so many people died, right? But it wasn't the ventilator. It was the sedation and mobility practices and having too many patients to care for. Yeah. Ventilators are yeah. not the problem. They can be used well. They save lives. But advanced directives are extremely important. Tell your loved ones what you want, what you don't want. You should have a choice. Sometimes sedation is essential. If someone's having active seizures, if they have Mm-hmm. swelling and pressure in their brains like there are exceptions but for the most part it's really not necessary so you should have a choice and mm-hmm. we're not used to giving patients that option we give informed consents like sign here here's a breathing tube say that you're okay with it but we don't say are you okay with being sedated would you like to not be sedated do you want to wake up after giving the breathing tube and see how you're doing can we see if we can help your anxiety and any discomfort with other ways besides making you comatose we don't discuss those things. Yeah. But if the general public knows, then they can demand those things. They can go in there saying, Hey, I know that sedation is going to increase my chances of dying, having infection, stick me on the ventilator for longer, make me disabled for the rest of my life. So I'm going to make a choice to wake up. And if, even if that's not what you do, it's my choice, my body, let's work through this. Patients should have a choice, but it has to start with being educated about it first. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. And for finding that person that you can tell like your spouse or next of kin like do not put I'm about to go tell my (laughs) wife right now do not do that I do not want it and I think that kind of wake-up call is great we love to leave our listeners with a message like go have this conversation with whoever you need to have it with and do your own research and decide for yourself so that you know if and when something horrible happens you're prepped and get an advanced directive in order and give it to someone you trust (laughs) yeah absolutely yeah obviously that is like a great kind of call to action for everyone to just have that in place and to know that you have autonomy that's something that city and i talk about a lot especially that's kind of why we started our podcast was to give Mm -hmm. patients and regular people like the information to have autonomy with their health decisions um but lastly we've been asking all of our guests on the podcast one question that kind of like is across all all different types of people we have and it is how do you take your coffee that's a trick question because i've never had a coffee before (laughs) <laughs> oh wow. wow and you have three kids <laughs> but i like italian sodas hey, okay. that sounds great 
<laughs> that sounds delicious. Well, how's that for unique? Cross the board. It's super That's unique. very unique. <laughs> Never happens. <laughs> Everyone's like, just with all the caffeine, you're like, I don't need it. I'm I'm <laughs> yeah. energized by my mission is what I really took from your conversation today. I'm neurotic yeah. enough. I'm good. <laughs> Oh, well, this has been awesome. Well, thank you so much. Well, thanks so much, ladies. I appreciate this. This has been great. We also linked Kaylee's podcast, Walking Home from the ICU, in our show notes. So make sure you check it out there. Okay. What the hell? <laughs> I am shook. Yeah, I didn't know any of this. I had never even heard of the term ICU delirium. And after learning about this from Kaylee, I'm so surprised that more people don't know this. I feel like people freak out and they're like, I must be going nuts. So they don't say anything. Exactly. They think that it's just them by themselves. So I think... Kaylee's doing such an important thing because the more attention you can bring to this, the more people know they're not alone. They're not experiencing this in a vacuum, right? They're like everybody, so many people, right? 80% of patients experience it. So after we interviewed her, I was like poking around and some people, their hallucinations are not like aggressive, but some people it's like crazy, right? I know you poked around a bit too. Yeah. What I what I learned in my research is that basically I kind of thought when I started reading this that they were just nightmares, but they're way more than just vivid nightmares. They're based on like real life stimuli that patients are actually experiencing. So someone who has like pain in their arms. I read a story about a woman who hallucinated repetitively having her arms cut off by one of yeah. the nurses with a hacksaw. Yeah, because they can hear The nurses' voices, too. So some... Exactly. I read a similar story, and when they got out of, like, sedation, they were looking at the nurse like... Right. What did you do to me? Because in their memory, that person had been, like... Correct. Chopping them up. I would be like, you gotta go. Gotta get out Yeah, and the stories that Kaylee got into, like the one where she was talking about the guy having his hands nailed down to the forest floor while his children are... Can you imagine? No. And it's not uncommon. Patients who needed a catheter reported hallucinations of, like, trigger warning, violent sexual abuse, and it's horrifying. So... And in these patients' minds, it's not like a hypothetical situation. These are like real examples reported by people who survive sedation. I think we, and I know she said this in an episode, and I know we said it too. It's like people think like, oh, they're peaceful and they're sleeping. And what scared me after the episode is I was thinking, oh, my God, (laughs) I think, you know, that they're calm and safe and internally. Right. They're so scared and they're not sleeping. Yeah, because that's kind of the narrative that's been put forward is like they're peaceful, they're sleeping. But many patients like what she was saying is that patients have like PTSD after prolonged ventilation, because for these people, their trauma is real. Like it really happened to them. Absolutely. Thinking about it after like when we interviewed her, I started thinking about it and I was like, okay, it doesn't even matter whether something really happened to you. If it feels like it happened to you and you have memories it of it happening to you, then that is your reality, right? Exactly. And your Agreed. trauma is real if it happened to you in your brain. I, I, I totally 100% agree. Yeah. Can't tell me otherwise. No, I don't care. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. So you mentioned like 80% of ventilator patients suffer from uh, ICU delirium, which is in itself like... A scary number. Yeah, totally. And I read in roughly like a third of those cases that their cognitive problems were so severe that even a year after they were discharged, they mimicked mild traumatic brain injury. You know, this is my area of specialty. Guys, if you don't know yet, this is exactly what I do research on for my PhD. And specifically, like behavioral and cognitive issues are a big part of my focus. And that fact is horrifying because the cognitive issues that you see after traumatic brain injury can range anywhere from mild to incredibly severe. Like people are not sometimes capable of functioning on their own. And so up to a year after discharge, 
is like you're doing some really serious damage to your brain if they're mimicking brain injury. That's crazy. And it's drug induced. That's terrifying. Yep. And the fact that we think these drugs are palliative, you know, people in the ICU, a lot of nurses, like Kaylee said, most of the nurses there think they're doing it for the good of the patient. And they're really like doing really severe long term damage. So something that was uh, funny after we recorded the episode, I I left the closet. Right. And I go to Michelle and I was like, don't you ever sedate me. (laughs) I did the exact same thing to Eric. I was like, do not put me under no matter what. And she was like, that's not true because I had surgery and I was under sedation. So I want to be clear, like, that's not what we're talking about. It's It's like long term sedation, medically induced comas. And I will say some people. Some people may react and they receive these kinds of experiences after being sedated for a surgery. We don't know. Yeah. Right. But for the cases that we're talking about, it's long term sedation for like to in the ICU. Yeah. I just wanted to say that because she was like, no. And I was like, absolutely. Yes. (laughs) And there (laughs) are. This is real. This is another thing we should say, and I I think Kaylee mentioned this, too. But like there are cases where a medically induced coma is biologically necessary for a patient to recover so that's like a special case right but I remember I've been in in the ICU with loved ones who were sedated and I remember them pushing huge doses of like Ativan which is an anti-anxiety drug and I asked one of the nurses I was like can you explain to me why you're giving my loved one Ativan like that's confusing to me because they're they're sleeping, right? And she's like, well, you know, it's just to control their anxiety and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, now I know yeah, that they give patients Ativan because they're experiencing like horribly anxiety inducing things. So I was looking into this and the PTSD part because I was really, yeah. I was like curious. Me too. And I read that a quarter of all ICU patients suffer from PTSD wow. once they leave. And that's a rate that's like on the same level as combat vets and rape victims. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? A fourth oh of people. God. Wow. That's that's horrifying. But it I, makes sense it if does. you think about it. It's something I've never thought about. But if you think about what their body, their mind, they're going through, like yeah. it makes sense that you would have that. But I never thought. Yeah of PTSD for those people. No, I never I never even knew about this. So it's like what are you having PTSD from? It, like before you know about the delirium, right? Right, right, exactly. But one exactly. of the things I saw that you put in your research that I saw that was like really interesting is in a lot of cases people experienced this like trauma surrounding a choice about like staying alive or dying like a lot of these people see themselves dying over and over and over and it's terrifying I can't imagine I can't imagine coming out of that without having PTSD I would be crazy I like write about this guy who he every every day quote unquote right in his Mm -hmm. hallucinations he had to fight like to stay alive like he had to do obstacles and he was like can you imagine no I barely want to get out of bed now in everyday life I could not do (laughs) mental (laughs) obstacles no I'm not ready for it also it feels so physical right because if they're like fighting their restraints in their sedated state like they're doing it physically too and I love that you said that about restraints because I have a story. It's on episode 52 of Walking Home from the ICU of Kaylee's podcast. So this man was released from the hospital after a month in a coma. So he was in the coma for a month. And his wife was telling him he was hospitalized and he had sepsis. But his memory, his mind was absolutely in a different place. Yeah. He remembered being sent to prison and he was there for 10 <sighs> years. So his hallucination was 10 years <sighs> of being in prison. And while he was in prison, which is already a shitty hallucination, like if I'm going to have a right. hallucination, can I have a pleasant one? Like, why does it have like a to rainbow? be <laughs> like literally? A, can a, I be like, on a cloud with a unicorn? No. <laughs> so he remembers being hung from the ceiling and tortured daily in prison oh, for what he thought God. was 10 years that he was being stabbed with swords and mutilated oh. every single day he was being tortured. I think he said two years afterwards that he finally came around to that. His wife was telling the truth. So he said in his interview that he was like, 
I had to decide if I believed my wife yeah. or I believed my mind. That's terrifying. That feels like Manchurian candidate, like gaslighting business. It's terrifying. It's, and he was so, his interview was so straight to the point that it was almost like I could feel yeah. his frustration with that, right? Yeah. Did he have like cognitive symptoms too? So he like went on to say like he couldn't do basic tasks. He couldn't tie his shoes. Oh. He would see a chair and be like, I know what that is, but he couldn't remember the names of simple objects. That's crazy. And he had to go to physical therapy and like orthopedic stuff yeah. because he had severe shoulder injury from his restraints. Oh my God. Because he was so actively engaged even through sedation yeah and he like for five oh this is when the five years came up so for five years after being like discharged mm -hmm. he did not leave his house <gasps> except for his medical appointments because and he cut everyone off except his wife because of what he went through and he was so scared I really don't blame him that sounds terrifying and while I was reading about it like as someone who is in the field of neuroscience, I was reading about it and I was like, I can't figure out why delirium happens. There's not enough medical research on this because no one really seems to know. But like Kaylee talked about, when you put people's brains in a scanner who are sedated like this, they're not resting. They're not sleeping. Right. They're going through these like complex scenarios where they're like fighting for their lives. And it's crazy. Sometimes I wake up from a dream. And I was like, that was crazy. Right. Like some, and I have like those vivid dreams where I'll be in my dream and I'll be like, this is weird. This is probably a dream. Yeah. Like in my own dream, I'm like, this probably ain't real. So to the point that my mind would convince me, mm -hmm. like they're living whatever, they are essentially living that exactly. traumatic experience if their brain has gone through it. Yeah. Right. And the other thing that I, oh, no, they 100% are. Like, that's their reality. I totally agree. I think more than anything, we need to, like, more research very clearly needs to be done about this. Like, Kaylee knows what she's talking about. She's an ICU nurse who has, like, lived through all of this and done all of this for years and years. If anybody knows what patient care is really like, it's her. Yeah. I love that she's going into consulting. Like, I love that she is being hired. Me too. By you know, ICUs and leaders in the medical space. And I love that people are like, look, mm -hmm. you have new isn't scary in this, like new is necessary. Like she needs to be, you know, it reminds right. me of like what we felt about like Dr. Beeson, like they need to be out there. I just think yeah. I'm so glad. I'm so happy that we talked to her because I learned so much. And when I started Googling it, I was like, oh, no, nah. <laughs> no, never again. Yeah. Nope. You're not taking me. No, not alive. <laughs> it also gives me so much hope, though, that she's going into these spaces with doctors who have worked yeah. in ICUs for really long periods of time, and they're taking her feedback and making mm -hmm. changes based on that. Like, that gives me so much hope. I know, because she's, like... Very educated and so cool. Yeah. I think it's, it's so, great. So, go listen to Kaylee's podcast. She's great. Thank you, Kaylee, for being on our show. Thank you for educating the public and the medical community about this. And us. <laughs> and us. Thank <laughs> you for I telling us. Of things in my will. <laughs> Correct. About to go do a Vance directive right now. Now that COVID cases are back on the rise with the Delta variant, I think it's important to say this. When patients go into the ICU and get sedated and they have to be alone. Yeah. The families are the things that keep them grounded, at least somewhat, in reality. Like, your family being there with you, they hear your voice. They understand what you're saying to them sometimes. And that repetition of, like, your family telling you it's going to be okay is so important. And when patients are isolated and alone in the ICU, they're having a much, much harder time than even patients who are there with their families because they have no one there to ground them in reality. No, I just think everyone should go check out her podcast because it is absolutely shocking and just go in. Now you have this bit of information, so you know more. You're a little bit more prepared now than you were before. She has lots of really amazing survivor stories and like firsthand accounts. And they are those I think to me are more impactful than anything is hearing exactly what 
the person themselves lived through and exactly what their experience was because that's way better than hearing a statistic or hearing a number or hearing a doctor talk about it right is hearing a first-hand account so thank you Kaylee for putting that out there yeah you're the best go check her out go subscribe to her podcast learn a little something um and now that you know this check on your loved ones and be prepared and while you're subscribing to podcasts go ahead yeah, while you're in the mood while you're in the <laughs> while you're in the general vicinity go ahead and smash that subscribe button smash it <laughs> smash it smash it uh leave us a review on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher wherever you get your podcast that's like number one it's the best thing that you can do for us personally and professionally <laughs> we always read them and love them so much we text them to each other and we cry <laughs> literally every time Follow us on our social media. Hit us up, DM us if you have a recommendation. Um, we post a couple polls about what you'd like to hear next. So definitely engage with us there and send us an email and be our friend. <laughs> yeah. If you catch us on Instagram, you can get access to those polls and have a little bit of sway on what we cover next. Oh, wait till shway. Shway, shway, shway. Shway, shway. Okay. Thanks for listening. You the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>